You may qualify for a 10% credit on your boat insurance, or you could save hundreds of dollars on all of your insurance. This is Captain's Log, and we'll be right back to tell you how. This is Captain's Log with your host, Captain Mark Gray. Welcome aboard. Harbor Village is a colorful waterfront complex with over 40 varieties of shops, international cuisine, and even a nostalgic carousel just for fun. Whether you take a harbor cruise or just watch the fishermen unload their catch of the day, it's a great place for the whole family. Ventura Harbor Village, located on Spinnaker Drive in the Ventura Harbor. Public docks are available for those coming by boat. Please welcome our guest, Mr. Hell Newcomb. He's a broker with Colonial Western Insurance. <laughs> Mr. Newcomb, uh, could you explain to us the difference between being a brokerage insurance firm versus a standard insurance company? Well, it's a misconception on many people uh, that uh, the insurance companies uh, sell insurance wherever you want to place it. In other words, what I'm saying is that a direct writer for an insurance company writes insurance with that company and no other company, whereas an agent may have an appointment with many different insurance companies. And because of that reason, he is in a better position to shop for a product, if you will, and an insurance policy, which is the product that serves your purpose at the best possible price. And uh, that essentially is the difference. Uh, the Colonial Western Agency, uh, my employer, is a, uh, an agency that is, has appointments with many insurance companies. We're a full-line insurance agency in that we place life insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, fire and casualty, meaning automobile, homeowners insurance, and I personally am involved in the marine insurance. And again, my purpose in placing insurance is to get the best policy for the kind of coverage that the person wants to take care of their marine insurance needs at the very best price. Okay, speaking about price also, like being the type of agency or firm that you are, uh, can you go directly to the people that underwrite, put up the money and the policy, rather than some small insurance agencies that go indirectly, you know, there are a lot of commissions there, and get a better price or some kind of group price? No. Uh, no. As an individual, you as an individual, as a boat owner, for example, might want to place your insurance with X company. They do not write directly with you. They write through agents. They don't write insurance with individuals. They write mm -hmm. through agencies. And if that answers your question. Right. So uh -huh. there is, a, contrary to what many people believe, there isn't a tremendous amount of insurance premium and commission that the agent has to play with and consequently uh, he will get the particulars on your vessel 
and shop that with the various companies with whom he places an insurance and the uh, the commissions will be probably no more than 20 percent if that are high with any of the companies mm -hmm. could you could you explain to us for the voters as we're said on the open of the show that you could get a 10 percent credit or you know, monies off your insurance or rebate. Could you explain how that works? Yes, um, it's very, very important, not only from the monetary standpoint, it's very important from the safety standpoint. We've stressed that over and over again, and we will continue to stress the safety of the person and their vessel and their passengers. But the credits that <coughs> the insurance companies uh, will grant, and they will vary, but for the most part, they're approximately 10% credit for the completion of a course in boating safety, navigation, seamanship that is offered by the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Power Squadrons. And I would suggest that any person that has any ambition about becoming a sailor, whether it's power or sail, that they avail themselves of those courses. Now, you can go and uh, attend high schools, for example, or sailing courses that uh, are offered by some marinas but those are not recognized as full courses that the insurance companies would give uh, credits on. I understand that if you have an older boat, and I believe the industry thinks along the terms of about 20 years, uh, I've called up quite a few agencies when I had an older boat and found that none of them insure the boat <coughs> regardless of a good survey or anything. Yeah, it's becoming more and more difficult today because the, the, uh, the industry has changed. There's so many modern modern uh, concepts in the boats now that weren't part of the older boats and uh, you got to remember too that uh, 20 years ago they were building wooden boats very few of them were building fiberglass and uh, that has proven to be one of the things that's uh, that's a great safety factor because of the the problems that they ran into with dry rot worms and uh, just a general dying of the wood. Now that's not to say that there aren't some magnificent wooden boats, but these are boats that have had meticulous care, people who are really proud of their vessels and uh, take a great, get a great deal more care than the average boat owner does. But uh, when a vessel reaches 20 years, it is extremely hard to place insurance on it. I also understand that uh, insurance p plays a big part in getting a slip in a harbor. It's kind of a domino theory with boats. You buy the boat, you have to have a survey to get the insurance. You have to have the insurance to get into the slip in the harbor yes. to rent a slip. And could you explain the differences in the harbors it such as coal like, insurance? Yeah, I understand what you mean. It almost sounds like there's a, it's collusion, but it really isn't. Essentially, the, the people who operate the marinas have to be held harmless because of the fact that accidents can occur. Uh, for example, I'll just say that since, since we're uh, somebody who really didn't pay a great deal of attention, didn't realize that when they started their engine that there was a gas leak, and this happened to be a gas-powered boat. The gas leak not only caught fire, but it spilled off into the marina, and then it began to spread on the water. As you know, it mm -hmm. is louder than water, so it floats on the surface. It burned. It caught the other boats in the adjacent slips of fire. Now, the, the person who was a victim of this, the person who wasn't even there, come to the marina and found that their boat has been burned, they're going to want some recourse. They're going to want some restitution. So who do they turn to? They turn to the man who owned the boat that had the fire, or they turn to the marina. So the marina wants to be protected. They want to make certain that that boat owner, each boat owner, has adequate coverage. Now, I believe in most of the marinas, not all, but most of the marinas require that you carry $300,000 liability, or what we refer to as protection and, and indemnity. They're, they're co-insured on the policy. They are named, the marinas are named as co-insured, or the term is additional insured. And that protects the marina against any litigation that they may not be a party to. It protects them, and that's, uh, that's the purpose in that. That sounds pretty fair to me, you know, from that standpoint. But it is amazing because in our show we try to look at the viewpoint of a new boat buyer, a new person coming in, that there are so many steps, you know, with the survey and the take it in the yard and do the bottom job and then the insurance. And one thing is very much conditioned upon, you know, or contingent upon the other. Yeah. Uh, what if you could not get insurance, say, would you have to leave your boat in the boatyard or what happens? 
Well, if you bought a boat and you couldn't get insurance on it, it would, my, my advice would be to make sure, number one, that that did muster, pass muster, or pass a very stringent dry dock or haul out survey so that the bottom, the keel, and everything below the waterline could be inspected, as well as the interior and exterior and the superstructures. The entire boat on a dry dock or haul out survey is a complete total picture of the condition of that boat, that is when you finally sign the agreement and make the purchase. Now, you have either you pay cash for the boat or the boat is financed. If the boat is financed, the lender is certainly going to want his protection. So he wants that boat insured, and if you don't insure it, he will insure it, and it will cost you a great deal more to have the lender insure the boat. So if you have a good insurance agent who is knowledgeable in the marine aspects of this, he will do an awful lot to help you in getting yourself well placed. He'll work. work with you. In other words, if you have a top-notch survey, you might call 10 companies that say, no, we don't insure That's older correct. boats, period. That's but correct. I do know for a fact that Colonial Western does insure older boats yeah. uh, from time to time, contingent upon a good survey. Well, now it's time for the section of the show called Beauchamp, uh, Beauchamp Motion, right? Yeah. Boating Fashion and Motion. We'll be right back with Beauchamp Motion after this. The captain's log is like no other ship's logbook you'll find in the world today. It's unsurpassed in quality and workmanship. Created from scratch, its 400 pages are divided into 19 sensible, practical, and easy-to-use chapters, each tab for convenient access. Beautifully illustrated throughout with 23 original pen and ink drawings, the captain's log is full of fresh new ideas. This is the first logbook ever published with two cruising formats, one for day cruises and another for long passages. Other unique selections include stores ledger, cruising friends, diagrams, separate repair and maintenance chapters, and the box is much more. You can now document a wealth of valuable information in one big, beautiful book. And whether your edition graces your coffee table or stows in its own log keeper, you will have a handsome and lasting record of your vessel and all your cherished memories aboard her. Also designed for carrying the captain's log and your other valuable ship's documents, passports, and boat keys, the Sea Brief is water resistant and will float with all its contents. The captain's log is the perfect christening gift and perhaps the end of your frustrating search for the ultimate ship's logbook. Blending comfort, performance, and value, Catalina yachts continue a tradition of building outstanding sailboats in every class. Sail the Catalina 30 and experience this successful combination of a modern, efficient hull shape with spacious accommodations that create the perfect balance in a modern racer cruiser. America's largest sailboat manufacturer invites you to call a Catalina yacht dealer in your area today. Our first model is Johanna De Hoya. She's wearing a Rio bathing suit. It's in cotton lycra. The wrap skirt is in 100% cotton. Very nice. You can wear it to the beach and feel completely covered. Very low back on the suit. Cotton's very nice because you don't have to worry about it snagging. A lot more durable. Thank you very much, Johanna. Our next suit is being worn by Kathy Delano. It's a Ventura bikini suit. It's got the very deep V in the front with the black. You can have this made in any colors you want. She's wearing the triangle top with the pink with the contrasting black straps is very nice. Thank you, Kathy. Our next suit is being worn by Michelle Picard. It's a cruise. It comes in a lot of different prints. This is very nice with the shearing in the front, the black slide on the bottom that stays in place, and the bandeau top. Thank you, Michelle. Our last suit is being worn by Diane Burlington. This is one of our new suits from France. 
It's nice with the metallic material. One of the good features about this, see how wide the sides are, but you can roll them down and you can make it into a very small bikini. Very pretty colors. It comes also in the silver. The, what Diane has on is the lilac. It comes in red, also a mint green. With a pair of black shorts or a black skirt, this is a dynamite outfit. Very pretty. Thank you, Diane. Now back to you, Mark. That was Beauchamp Motion with Miss Donna Russell, who sponsored and coordinated that event. And she is with Ventura Bikini. Now we're back with Mr. Hal Newcomb of Colonial Western Insurance. Uh, Mr. Newcomb, can you say something as to the concern from the insurance company's vantage point towards theft and all of these things, statistical information, or, you know, how does the insurance company look at us, the small guy? Well, I think any insurer is primarily interested in the in the safety and the well-being of the of the insured party. I'm sure I can say that, and I don't pre presume to be a spokesman for the insurance company, but I think that is primary in each person, each company's mind, is the safety and well-being of the captain, the passengers, and the crew. However, I know for a fact that the insurance companies have displayed a great deal of concern about the problem of having boats stolen and it's it's very easy for a boat to be stolen in spite of what precautions the usual person takes because the fact that they take a piece of string and tie it to a floating dock doesn't mean that somebody can't cut the string or mm -hmm. to be more precise lines dock lines and whatnot and it uh, if you think that cars can be stolen in a hurry a boat can be stolen just as quickly so a boat can be stolen and in within, within a relatively short period of time, a week or so, uh, many boat owners don't even realize that their vessel has been stolen. They don't come to their dock like you go to your garage. Somebody steals your car, you know, within a matter of a few hours. Well, how, do you, how can you, uh, do you have to have someone checking on your boat constantly or you doesn't the do harbor that. patrol it's do just, it or no, have a system? they're or? overworked. They can't mm -hmm. even do the job that they're assigned. The same thing with the Coast Guard does. Is it, the, the uh, inadequate funding to, to have water cops uh, patrol the waters and the sheriffs and the highway patroller, and I'm not saying incompetent, they're just not trained to do this. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them to even find a vessel that they have a complete total description of because they can change for one thing. Keep in mind that your Charlie Foxtrot number or the CF number that is on each boat that is uh, registered with the Department of Motor Vehicles is uh, is not an identifying number that you would like like you would find on an automobile in the license plate. So the CF number can be changed, the boat can be painted, and the boat can be altered in appearance with a few modifications to a point where that boat might even be in the slip next to the owner that had the boat stolen and he wouldn't even recognize I, it. I think that if there are any less than honest people watching, they might be considering a new avenue of a source of money. Well, but what, what is your, your idea or, or from the insurance company standpoint? What does protect the boat? From this. How well, I don't have any ideas it? from the insurance company, but just a couple of ideas of my own, and mm -hmm. I don't know that they're practical, but anything that impedes the theft of a vessel is, uh, is better than leaving it wide open. Uh, we've all heard stories about how people can jump the starter, or jump the ignition on an automobile within a matter of moments of professional thief. This can be done with a key and an ignition, if you will, on a powerboat or a sailboat that has an engine. Keep in mind, Mark, that very few sailboats are pure, pure sailboats in that they don't have an engine. You rarely ever see anybody back their sailboat out of the slip under sail. And very few people can get their boats into the slip sailboats under sail. So it's something that requires an engine. So my suggestion is one that I'm sure others could uh, elaborate on would be to to make your engine inoperable with a simple little thing like maybe perhaps taking a rotor cap out of a gasoline engine distributor system or maybe taking a spark plug wire and taking it home with you. Right. You bring uh -huh. that back when you want to use the boat and in the meantime very few thieves are going to be prepared to come down and find the part that's missing and have that part in their pocket. It's just a thought off the top of my head. It might that's impede I think the theft. Yeah. 
Um, so actually, come, you could come to your boat, find the battery is dead because a thief hot wired it and a little bit of damage, but your boat's still going to be there. That's exactly right. I do know that uh, a lot of my friends and people, you know, with sailboats have an outboard, you know, which is quite easy to use. What I do on my little sailboat is I take the gas line off and lock it down below. So you need fuel, number one. And also I change the controls on it, the mixture, to where I know if, if someone did start it up, if they didn't correct the mixture, it would quit. You know, it wouldn't run. But very it's just, good, just a little minor thing. Make and it I, difficult. It's kind of a subconscious thing, you know, in way, the way in which I uh, did that. Make it difficult for the mm -hmm. thief uh, to steal your car, your, get in your house, or take your boat. And uh, that's one thing that the insurance companies I'm, I, I, I know are very concerned about. Not too long ago, one of the carriers, and we referred to the insurance companies as carriers, I was speaking with uh, one of the corporate officers of this particular company, and they had had a very, very fine sale would have been stolen and uh, was gone about two weeks. And when they did find it, they found it on the beach in Baja, and it didn't have anything left to salvage. Mm -hmm. Everything that was worth anything at all had been taken from that vessel. It was just a hull. And of course, that means that it's a total loss to the insurance company. And, uh, and they, the owner too, as well. Yeah. Well, this is Captain's Log. We have uh, sea tales coming up next. This segment could save your life or that of a loved one. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Marina Sailing, experience it, the vacation of a lifetime, islands to explore, sheltered coves to discover, clear water to enjoy. You say you don't know how to sail, well that's okay, because we've been teaching people to sail for over 25 years. In fact, we're California's oldest and largest sailing club with 70 boats and three locations to serve you. Come on down, take the challenge. We're Marina Sailing. Welcome to Sea Tales. We're still here with Mr. Hal Newcomb, our guest today, and today we are going to change it just a little bit in that I'm going to tell a, a story of my first sailing adventure, which hopefully that may save someone's life too. Uh, basically what happened was I fell in love with sailboats one weekend when I went out with a friend and a guy let us borrow it and sleep on it, you know, and I thought it was just great. And uh, I didn't have the money at that time or the knowledge or desire to go out and just buy a boat or charter a boat. So I hired on as a crew to sail through the Bahamas and South America. And uh, I went with an experienced captain. Uh, what we didn't plan on was not only getting chased by some Haitian pirates off Haiti, but the minute we got to the southern tip of Haiti, we ran into a gale winds and 25 foot high seas all the way down to South America and back up to the other side of Cuba. And the first day out, the hatch blew off on us. Fortunately, the captain that I was crewing on his boat had a piece of wood cut for each porthole and every hole on the boat. So he just went down, turned on the Honda generator, pulled out a drill, drilled the holes through the, the plywood that was pre-cut, and glued it in. But uh, everything else in the boat was wet for about a month thereafter. And we were working four hours on and four off, and so you become very tired. Uh, we got about two hours sleep on our four hours off because we'd be cooking and navigating and what have you. To sleep in eight, in 25 foot seas and stuff, you're bouncing so much that all, all we could do is roll up in a sail because everything was wet, as I've said, and uh, lay down in the walkway so that as the boat bounced around, you know, we wouldn't fall out of the bed. You couldn't really stand in a bed or sit in a bed. And uh, so at any rate, we became very exhausted. And that's why I always tell people, well, if you're going to go on your first cruise or two or three, take plenty of people to share the responsibility 
if you're going to be out there for a while. And one night, uh, it w I was just coming off shift, and I had both hands on the hatch. And my I was sitting inside the hatch, actually. And my partner, the captain, had the harness on, safety harness, which attaches him to the boat. The tiller that you steer the boat with was tied off with one inch surgical tubing to a cleat because it takes both hands and feet to hold it. And that kind of helped take some of the spring. And all of a sudden, as we're coming down a wave, the keel that sticks down on the sailboat slipped out of the wave and the boat fell down real sharp. And it threw me right over the rail. Fortunately, I grabbed the little handrail that was there and flipped upside down, hit my head on the bottom of the boat, cut it open. And it's so odd that you can get to the point of exhaustion to where you're out in the Caribbean, it's the middle of the night, here you are hanging on to a little wire, and, and you actually have a conscious thought of, gee, should I let go and practice our man overboard? You know, I mean, because you are at a point of a total exhaustion, you know, and uh, I obviously I thought, nah, I don't think so, and pulled myself back up on the boat. I guess the moral of the story is that, you know, it's a heck of a sailing experience for a first trip, but this could happen to anybody. If you go out in the water, the weather can kick up. And if you don't take it in small bites and go out with experienced people and take enough people, you know, if you don't get the education that you need and all, you're pretty much going to run into a bad situation someday, and chances are you may not survive. And quite simply put, you don't have the skills to survive. So, what do you think of that, Hal? I think that's very true, and I think it's a very good lesson for everybody to listen to, experienced sailors as well as the neophyte. We can oh. all learn. I do know this, that uh, I myself have a power squadron certificate and all, and you take one class a week for an hour a week, and I thank God for such people as the power squadron and the Coast Guard Auxiliary that do give free boating classes to the public. But at one hour a week, for 10 weeks to get the, the basic certificate, you know, is quite a long time. And you know as well as I do, if I bought a boat today, then I'm thinking, well, how do I learn how to use it now that I have the boat? And every week I'm getting that little class, I'm going to be out having fun. And I may be out at Channel Islands with a girl on board that's never been sailing in her life, just having a great time and heading back one day. And the winds will kick up on sure. you sometime sure. and you're, you're, you're going to have a bad situation. The difference in survival or non-survival, I believe, is education, training, experience, doing it properly, you know, thinking about what I you're doing. I take my hats off to those people who are the instructors mm -hmm. in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and yeah. the Pirate Squadron. They I, do a I marvelous thank God service. For them. Yep. And that's why I'm doing this show. We hope to save lives, perhaps yours, perhaps one of your loved ones. This is Mark Gray, and this has been Captain's Log. Thank you. Well, Hal, now can I... Now can Oh,